Wow. <laughs> well, I, what I like about CRIR is we're very open to all sorts. <laughs> I can hardly speak tonight and put a sentence together because I'm tired. Guate has made his contribution. Marcos made his, David his, and you know, we can all get along and we don't agree on everything. <laughs> isn't that, isn't that, that's how growth happens, right? That's right. That's right. So I thank David for all those kind words. Okay, uh, to our last speaker is Stephen Durham, familiar to many of you as a member of the Freedom Socialist Party National Committee. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about his history for people who don't know anything about Stephen. He started out in politics uh, young as well. He was a high school exchange student in Brazil when uh, the generals staged a coup and initiated a dictatorship that lasted for 21 years. From Brazil, he went to school at uh, UC Berkeley where he was a radical. He was a draft resistor. He was a gay liberationist a free speech activist, and um, he, he, went, he learned Spanish so that he became trilingual, not only speaking Portuguese, but also, uh, also Spanish. And uh, one of the things that he did at Berkeley that was really very important was he was a part of the struggle for the Ethnic Studies Department, which at Berkeley was very violent, was led by black students and didn't have that much support among uh, white students. And so Stephen uh, was very faithful to that struggle and, and helped eventually to win ethnic studies. Uh, he worked as a waiter, both in New York City and in Los Angeles, where his language skills were, he put them to use defending workers from the dishwashers all the way to the, to the maitre d's. Well, they were hard to defend, but captains. just the captains. <laughs> yeah, the, some of the captains, like, remember the stories. Um, Stephen actually reminded me, I was gonna say he's been the branch organizer uh, for the Freedom Socialist Party in LA and in Harlem, but he actually founded the Los Angeles branch. He was the the first uh, member of the Freedom Socialist Party in Los Angeles. Now he's the East Coast organizer for FSP and was participated in the meetings that brought him, that founded the CRIR. In 2012, Stephen ran for president uh, in the FSP's write-in campaign. And for any of you who were there when we were lectured on why we should never run for president, uh, I would like to tell you, had he been elected, Stephen would have dismantled the military. There's no question. So, all right, Stephen. And why the hell don't we just open the borders as well? <laughs> well, there's a lot to follow, and the comments have just been enormous. I mean, coming home from the translation in embryo, CRIR, the International Committee as an embryo of an international. Kwati gave a very interesting talk on men and women and Mexican culture and anti-Stalinism and religion. So as the last speaker, you get the last word, but you have to deal with, you, you're the act that comes next. <laughs> And so a lot has come before, and I don't know whether I'll be able even to say all I have to say. But first of all, I want to say it's a great honor to be on this panel with the three previous speakers and in this room with such fighters, such fighters for justice and equality in our hemisphere. And I think overall, you've take, gotten a lot from the previous speakers, but to say it very, very simply, we are here about defining our struggles and destinies and how they are linked. Despite all the differences we share in experience, language, culture, and even political differences. And that's been one of the most important things about CIR, CRIR is that people are, these, um, the other people on the panel have come here out of struggle where differences and democratic decision-making and democratic debate has not happened. 
And um, we are ex very excited about engaging in that together. But it's the political unity, the revolutionary political unity in the face of our diversity that is our strength and the hope for all of humanity. In today's globalized world, the struggle of each of us enriches the struggle of all of us. Militancy and bravery in one place, be it in Los Angeles, or Olinala, Guerrero, Santo Domingo, or San Jose, Costa Rica, encourages each of us to fight against our common enemy, capitalism, a system failing miserably to meet our needs while tearing mercilessly at the heart of Mother Nature, which we've discussed today here. And today's recipe for capitalism, to breathe life into it, its oxygen is a program of neoliberalism, which originated here in the heart of imperialism at the School of Chicago, School, Chicago School of Economics. But it was first forced with a vengeance by the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank on Latin America and Central America and the Caribbean. And always articulated as an international program in the service of finance capital, finance capital, bank capital, fictitious capital, stocks and bonds and pieces of paper. These are the um, characteristics. It's those pieces of paper and that shifting that caused the, the, the meltdown in 2008. That shifting, that, that ripoff, that huge ripoff based on paper that we're still suffering from is a function of finance capital, which is a function which runs the world for its interest in the age of imperialism. But as Gary told me at one point, I think I first heard about neoliberalism in about 1990. And Gary at one point said in a conversation on the phone, she said, well, you know, that's really a program for us too. Well, that was prophetic because I never thought about that, you know. You, would, you, you know, with this one-way solidarity of the U.S. movement where, you know, we support everybody else, but no one really talks about how before the 1990s, people were not really talking about how can we have a real solidarity, a revolutionary solidarity about how we can really change America, how the American Revolution, which won't just be our revolution, it'll be the revolution of the whole hemisphere and ultimately of the whole world, because everybody that tries to step forward step forward, they get stomped on by the Pentagon that we're out to dismantle. You know, that agenda of the Chicago boys, they were called the Chicago boys, that went to Chile and supported Pinochet and created the Chilean miracle. And people now threw all their money in Chile into the, NG, in, into the, into the stock market and now are pension, don't have pensions, all of that, all of that ultimately because it's an international, globalized, capitalist class that wants to pull down the whole world. Um, that agenda was for us as well. And I think after 2008 and what's happening uh, here in this country, I think that that's being driven home in the globalized, globalized world. And I think that the more and more the bankruptcy program of free trade, privatization of education, which we're involved in, and actually Kwati's comrades are involved in it, um, and Nupori's involved, fighting against the privatization of education, one of their comrades, the driving down of wages and working conditions, and the dismantling of the gains of our class, not only in this country, but around the world, is standing more exposed and naked. Great opportunity. The struggles like the current battle against privatization of education in Mexico and Chile. Now I'm repeating myself. <laughs> um, and impoverishes. This impoverishes the workers, of, the workers and peasants of Latin America and at the same time the most oppressed here. And people are driven from impoverishment to emigrate across the Rio Grande by the hundreds of thousands arriving in the U.S. These immigrants are paid low wages and are discriminated against in every aspect of their life, lives. Truth be told, these workers, along with low-wage women, are what have kept the U.S. economy afloat, both for years before and since the economic meltdown that hit Wall Street in 2007. However, whenever, whenever common cause has made 
has been made with these immigrant workers against the bosses, the whole U.S. working class has benefited. And that's what we have to show, and that's what we have to assert, and that's what we have to change, use that fact to change people's consciousness so that they believe in their own class and their own strength. During the many years I worked in the ho hotel and restaurant union, both here in Los Angeles and New York City, I witnessed over and over again the power of multinational labor solidarity of both documented and undocumented workers in the workplace. And when I was circling a petition, because the union had signed an agreement, the union had signed an agreement and wasn't letting us know what it was, and it was a petition to our union to say, what's in this contract that you signed for us? And I was threatened to be thrown out of the restaurant. It was a gay, undocumented worker that came up to me, and he said, I hate this place. Let's walk out of here. And I said, oh, no. <laughs> Don't walk out. Calm down. <laughs> we'll survive. <laughs> As the most exploited, the capitalists desperately need these workers to fill their pockets with profits, especially during the worldwide structural crisis. The massive, we all know about the massive 2006 immigrant rights upheaval here that gave rise to yearly May Day commemorations of the struggle of the Chicago martyrs, the Chicago martyrs themselves who were immigrant labor leaders who were executed at the end of the 19th century in the struggle for the eight-hour day. And here we are in 2013, seven years later, and those demonstrations are still up and running. Immigrant workers are also more open to the ideas of socialism because of the level of class struggle in the present and the past in their native countries against invasions, occupations, and the general exploitation of labor and natural resources, which has been the history of US imperialism in our hemisphere. In our current globalized world, immigrants are also key in the struggles of their native countries, and especially when they return home to visit. As Nestora Salgada's case shows, arriving in Seattle, Nestora worked hard to survive. She saw the emptiness, the vapidness, the emptiness of the American dream. But she also benefited from the existence, the existence of free speech and a history of civil rights movement, including the immigrant rights movement, organizing against Obama's massive, massive deportations. As a survivor of domestic abuse, she also benefited from the voice of feminism, which women and their male allies in this country fought hard to establish and keep alive. When Nestor returned to Olinala, she took the political lessons she learned here as an immigrant and as a naturalized US citizen. And drawing on her experience on both sides of the border, she emerged as a woman leader, a feminist, a fearless indigenous fighter for the people of Guerrero and against corruption and the barbarism, the barbarism of organized crime and drug traffickers. Nestor is not an isolated case. There's another woman that has emerged as a comandanta of, um, of, of the auto defenses in Mishra Khan. Capitalism is our enemy, but also capitalism is what unites us. This is certainly true when it comes to the drug trade. Drug tra sales mean huge profits for drug traffickers, drug corrupt politicians, and big banks that accumulate capital, no questions asked. Drug production in Latin America is fueled by the US market. Here, drugs are used as a means of social control to fill the profit-making prison industrial complex, just like deportations and Obama's Immigration policy fills the detention centers. Drugs are used to militarize the police and bolster the repressive capacity of the capitalist state, not only in this country, but in Latin America as well. And in Latin America, it targets radicals and those fighting against the status quo. How much time do I have? OK. Well, I really don't even know. Um, let me see. OK. All right. So maybe I'll just, well, the other thing I want to talk about was civil was civil rights and civil liberties, but also I think, I think I'll reduce that down to saying that there is a war on women globally, and there's a war on women in the US, and there's a war on women in our hemisphere, 
and there's a war on women internationally. But uh, in Latin America, there's only one place in our hemisphere where abortion exists, the right of reproductive freedom for women, and which doesn't exist without access to abortion and medical care and reproductive services. The only place it exists is in Cuba. Everywhere else, it is under attack. Uh, there was just a decision made last week, state laws are dismantling it in this country. And throughout Latin America, the women of Latin America, the, the women of socialist consciousness, the women of feminist consciousness in, um, in uh, Latin America are fighting against the same thing we're fighting against, which is the Catholic Church and an organized, the Catholic Church and an evangelical Protestant religions, many or originating here in the United States as an arm of the U.S. foreign policy. These zealots are out to cram a conservative, anti-woman, sexist, homophobic agenda down our throats and now has the support of Rafael Correa from Ecuador espousing the most backward oh, no. knowledge and doing it and, and the Catholic Church is supporting him. The Catholic Church is supporting him and using his speech to promote the family as the most important unit and that men are men and women are women and that never the two shall meet. <laughs> so that's that. The other thing that I want to talk about was how Obama's U.S. national security state is in the lead in terms of a fight, again, a fight to maintain our privacy and the war, a veritable war on indigenous people in our hemisphere and that, that we all know about what's happening in Mexico, but it's not just Mexico, it's Peru, it's Brazil, it's many countries, it's Chile especially too, um, but it's happening here in the United States where native lands are used as toxic dumping grounds for nuclear waste after being decimated by decades of uranium mining. There are hundreds, over 450 open pits from uranium mining on Indian land and the, and the uranium mining continues. So a revolutionary solu solution to all these demands and organization with a revolutionary program uh, that is what the Committee for, a Revolution, for a Revolutionary National Regroupment is. And it is, as David said, we can be, we'll be a beacon for uniting our struggles against our common enemy, capitalism. That's why the Freedom Socialist Party and other organizations here got together last summer to form CRIR. The committee is committed to challenging the one-way solidarity of single issues. Um, solidarity, one-way single issue solidarity. We support you, but we don't say what we think. We don't bring our knowledge, our experience as revolutionaries, not as imperialists, not as gringos, but as people with a, 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 a certain perspective. We listen to you, and we only ask that you listen to us, not necessarily agree with us. Okay. And we stand on a platform that recognizes the challenges and the opportunities of the current period. And as previous speakers have said, I think David said, we want a democratic centralist international. We need an international organization and we are that embryo as other people have said. We oppose sellout leaders of all kinds that, use, that maintain their privileges at the expense of those they claim to support. Um, and we support the, the critical leadership of the most oppressed in every struggle. Uh, and we've accomplished a lot. The Nestora campaign, the Lynn Stewart campaign, the civil rights lawyer imprisoned by the Bush administration for defending a Muslim cleric falsely accused of terrorism. We recognize that to build revolutionary hemispheric solidarity, we need parties, revolutionary parties with internationalist platforms that put every struggle in a hemispheric context under, under the slogan which is so simple and so true and so important, none of us is free until all of us is free. Right. Building the revolutionary parties in each, our country, in each of our countries, building the Freedom Socialist Party, POS, Nupori, and the PRT, in Costa Rica will enable us to strengthen the committee for 
revolutionary international recruitment and take up one by one the struggles in our countries and beyond our borders. These struggles will provide the fuel for forging alliances that can provide the foundation for a world based on mutual respect and the fulfillment of human need. Thank you.